It was a cool evening in October of 1938 as families gathered together in their living rooms, huddled around the radios to listen to Orson Welles presenting War of the Worlds. That particular night, as they gathered together, many families in the hustle and bustle of the introduction actually missed the disclaimer that Orson Welles said at the beginning that everything they were about to hear was fiction. Instead, they were lulled away by the sweet sounds of the big band orchestral music, not a lot different from our wonderful orchestra that plays every week. And uh, as they were playing, it was almost as if the great halls of New York City were brought into their living rooms through their radio sets. So when a breaking news announcement came on the radio talking about something else that was going on, it was just that. It was an interruption to the events that were already taking shape for what they thought was just their regular scheduled concert. As breaking news announcement after breaking news announcement continued to interrupt the dance uh, of the violins and the clarinets and, and the trumpets playing together, um, what was intended to be fiction and entertainment ended up actually presenting real problems in real places with real implications for their listeners. Orson Welles had intended nothing more than to entertain people, but, but in their day, that, that fake breaking news created such fear and anxiety and panic in the listeners that people literally believed that Martians were coming from space, invading Earth to kill every living thing in their path. And we could laugh about that today. It's it's funny thing to think about Martians coming from outer space, but then we remember it's 1938. This is right before World War II, where there's rumors of wars that are happening both in Europe and, and across the Pacific. And also was before science fiction was much of a popular genre, long before E.T. was a movie, long before Independence Day, long before Star Wars and Star Trek, long before Area 51. So historians and, and sociologists, they, they, they look at this time period and they notice that there's something about what happened that commanded the attention of everyone who was listening. And it demanded a response. In their day, people were filled with such panic that they couldn't help like a moth drawn to the flame. They had to know more. And so the curiosity reeled them in. Some people took to the streets. They were so filled with fear and anxiety. They ran out to the streets. They called their local police precincts up and down the eastern seaboard by the thousands asking for an update of what was going on with the aliens. We read last week in Acts chapter 2 about a moment where, where there was another kind of a crisis. It didn't create fear in their audience. Instead, it created the sense of awe and amazement that also drew people in. And we read in Acts chapter 2 how as the Holy Spirit was poured out on all believers, it created such a scene that, that people started speaking in tongues of other nations. We also learned last week that there was this feast that was happening in Jerusalem where people from all around the ancient known world were gathering in Jerusalem that particular weekend. So when the Holy Spirit was poured out, as people started speaking in these foreign languages, people from all around the world were walking around Jerusalem and heard their own language. They stopped. A crowd gathered around that upper room where the disciples were meeting in Acts chapter 2, asking the question, what's going on? They didn't know. Which brings us to our passage. And last week, Darren asked the question, the same question that was asked in Acts 2.12. What does all this mean? As he did that, he was seeking to answer the same question that we've been asking throughout this series as we're looking at the book of Acts. Why are we here? In other words, why do we get together every Sunday morning? Why would we invest such resources in intentionally seeking God together and investing each other? And what would be the end goal? Of such things. I believe as we continue on in our passage in Acts 2, we'll find three answers to that very question. Peter had a very carefully thought out response to those questions himself as, as he tried to address the crowd in what they perceived was some kind of a crisis moment that they didn't understand what was happening. I think in the same way what he found can speak to us in the middle of any crisis we may walk through, whether great or small. And the truth is, is that for some of us in this room, we have experienced crisis recently, whether it is cancer. 
a financial crisis, a job loss, maybe, maybe something that has happened to us because of what's been going on a national level or a global level. Whatever the case is, whenever we walk through a crisis, it, it, it requires us necessarily to slow down, to have a carefully thought out response. Not to run around and, and freak out thinking that, that aliens are coming, but instead be filled with hope. After all, as followers of Jesus, we do have a reason for hope, right? I believe that not only will we find a reason for ourselves to have hope as we look at this passage, but we'll also find reason to encourage other people along the way. So with that, let's dive into Acts chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Acts 2, starting in verse 14. We're going to pick up where, where, where Darren left off last week. The text begins, Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and proclaimed to them, Fellow Jews and all you residents of Jerusalem, let me explain this to you and pay attention to my words. I love how as this passage begins, Peter and the disciples are all standing up together in unity. After all, this is the same crowd of 12 people who when Jesus was arrested and crucified, they scattered in, in 12 different directions. They, they went their own way. Even when Jesus was with them, they were rarely known to be in step with each other. More often than not, they, they were marching to their own beats. As an example of that, James and John, the sons of thunder, in Mark chapter 10, they, they went to Jesus and they asked to be elevated above the other disciples. They said, can you appoint us to your right hand and your left hand? They, they wanted to stand up above everybody else. Peter, our dear friend Peter, he so many times in the New Testament, he spoke out of turn. He was rarely one to be in step with the rest of the disciples. And sometimes that worked out in his favor. Like when he saw Jesus walking on water and he asked if he could go out with Jesus, he actually got to take a couple of steps on the water. How cool would that be? Other times it didn't work out so well for him, like um, in Matthew 16, after the great confession at Caesarea Philippi, Peter said something that was so out of step that Jesus responded back with, get thee behind me, Satan. Whew, that was a strong rebuke. Peter was rarely known to at least speak in step in unity with the rest of the disciples. And yet here they were, Peter and all of the disciples standing together in unity because they knew that something so profound had happened through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that the response needed to be one of unity. Ultimately, because God loves unity. Not, not uniformity, not, not two of the same kind or, or almost like two clones being identical, but instead being on the same page. When I was first married, um, one of the first things that my wife and I did was we'd go grocery shopping together. Before I got married, when I'd go grocery shopping, I had my method of doing things. And probably some of you guys can relate to this, where I would have my list of things to do. I'd have my plan in, in my head of how I was going to go through the grocery store, hit the very specific aisles where I needed those items, and then get to the register. There even was a point where I actually tried to time myself and beat myself from each time when I went to the grocery store, just, just to get it done, right? Then I, I went shopping with my wife, and she had a very different model of going grocery shopping than I did. She'd go from one end of the store to get one thing to another end, and, and just keep going back and forth. At times, I, I felt like I needed a step counter, but I also realized very quickly, you don't bite the hand that feeds you. Quite literally, my wife was the chef, and she still is the primary chef for our household. She makes amazing dishes, whether at that point it was it was very well-seasoned Greek chicken, homemade, fresh-baked lasagna, or, or one of my favorites, just very moist, very tender roast. She never missed an ingredient. Her method wasn't my method, but she, she never forgot anything that we needed to get that particular week. I learned early on that while we agreed on the essentials, our, our approach could be different, and that was okay. And I think there's something in there for us as followers of Jesus as well. Uh, and not just Christians that are gathered in this room, but, but everyone who calls themselves a Christian in the capital C church, that we can agree on the essentials. The bedrock of Scripture is the foundation of our faith. Jesus, Him crucified and risen from the dead, as the source of our salvation. But then in other things, maybe we can give a little bit more liberty. So like when we come into to church together 
and the, the worship team is leading us in a song, in a style that we don't necessarily like, maybe we give a little room for that because the Holy Spirit wants to use that song to touch someone else in the room. Or maybe when we show up on a Sunday morning and someone else is sitting in the same seat that we've sat in for the last five years, we also give a little room for that because God wants that person to experience his presence in that place, in that moment. It is, after all, when we make our way the highway that we end up convoluting the message of Jesus and, and confusing it with, with a thousand other opinions that are floating around. Something so profound happened with Jesus and with the disciples in, in this moment as the Holy Spirit was poured out that they couldn't help but respond in unity. Literally, God's presence transformed them from that ragtag bunch of individuals to individuals who stood together. And I think there's something in there for us as well as we seek to answer that question, why are we here? That may be one of our answers. That when we get together and intentionally seek God, when we pray together and ask God to come and allow His Holy Spirit to touch us, that that's exactly what He wants to do. He wants to so transform us that not only are we encouraged and transformed personally, but collectively we're unified together so that we can be the hands and feet of Jesus to encourage other people around us to experience God as well. And it's when we're the hands and feet of Jesus that sometimes the Holy Spirit wants to, to bend us and move us in directions that we're not used to going, to, to move us in sync with each other, just like it requires us to flex our muscles when, when, we, when we bend our hands together in unity. God wants to do that through His Spirit if we let Him. And so one of the first lessons that Peter learned in our passage was the value of unity that comes for transformation through his spirit. Well, let's go back to the passage and see what else Peter learned. Picking back up where, where Peter started speaking. Fellow Jews and all you residents of Jerusalem, let me explain this to you and pay attention to my words. For these people aren't drunk, as you suppose, since it's only nine in the morning. On the contrary, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And it will be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all people. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. I will even pour out my spirit on my servants in those days, both men and women, and they will prophesy. I will display wonders in the heavens above and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I love how Peter is the spokesperson for the disciples and he steps up in this moment and starts sharing. But one thing I, that I'm struck by as I read this passage is Peter isn't actually using most of his own words. Most of what he says, he quotes from the Old Testament, from, from one of the, the smallest books towards the back of the Old Testament, the book of Joel. It, it was one of the 12 minor prophets. It's almost as if Peter really didn't trust his own words or his own authority. He knew there were so many other opinions that were out there. He had to appeal to an authority greater than himself. And so he leaned into God's word to do the speaking on his behalf. At that time, as we've already discussed, you know, people were gathered in Jerusalem for the Pentecost feast. Everyone had an opinion then as well as they do now. And I'm sure they were eager to share their opinions as they gathered together around tables, uh, around meals, different things for, this, for the, the Pentecost celebration as they were in town. One of the things that would have been on mind uh, of everyone who was there was the Messiah. After all, it had only been 50 days since Jesus had been crucified on the cross. And some were saying that Jesus was risen from the dead at that point. And so they probably would have shared their opinions about the Messiah as they gathered together around the tables. You know, scholars even question if, if Peter wanted to talk about the Messiah, why didn't Peter pick Isaiah or Jeremiah or, or one of the more well-known major prophets of the Old Testament? After all, the book of Joel, it is a small book. Joel's name is only mentioned once in the entire book, and we actually don't know a whole lot about Joel as a whole. But maybe there was something in that, that, that Peter knew something that we need to know about the anonymity of Joel. And maybe more than that, about what God was doing. That it wasn't about what Peter was doing. It wasn't about what the disciples were doing. It wasn't even necessarily about Joel. 
It was about God and his spirit being poured out in the hearts of believers that was transforming people. After all, didn't God want to pour out his spirit on all people? Didn't he want everyone who calls on the name of the Lord to be saved? In order to do that, sometimes that requires us to take a step back and God to get the credit, God to take the wheel and to drive, so to speak. One more thing that I know about Peter in this conversation is that Peter really didn't trust his own words. This was Peter, a simple fisherman. Not, he wasn't a theologian. He wasn't a teacher of the law. He hadn't spent his whole life studying scripture. But there's also something in there for us, that this was Peter the fisherman who somehow found some time somewhere along the way to memorize this very passage of scripture from the book of Joel. And so when the time came for him to explain what he saw was the supernatural act of God, what came bubbling up to the surface was the thing that he had memorized and had stored in his heart. I think that's another thing for us as followers of Jesus, that there's a lost art of memorizing scripture or studying scripture. I I don't know that that God has called every one of us in this room to memorize the, the amount of scripture that Peter did in this particular passage, but I think a lot of us, God has actually given those tools to do just that because it's when we spend time studying God's word meditating on it, memorizing it, letting it soak into our hearts, that when moments of crisis come, what comes bubbling up to the surface that not only can encourage us, but encourage other people, is God's word. That actually even brings a little bit of meaning to um, the the verse when Peter said in 1 Peter 3.15, in season or out of season, always be prepared to give an answer for the reason you have for hope for anyone who asks you of it. Charlton Heston, when he was preparing for his role in the Ten Commandments as Moses, he actually memorized large portions of the book of Exodus. He was even rumored to have have been walking around the set, quoting those passages of Scripture between filming different scenes. He wanted to make sure he stayed as close and as true to the biblical image of Moses for everyone on film to see that he memorized large portions of scripture. If he could do so, preparing for a Hollywood role in in a movie, I wonder how much more we could do that for ourselves to prepare us for life. Dwight Moody, who was a revivalist and a pastor in Chicago in the 1800s, he said early in his ministry that, that when he would spend time seeking God, he really wanted to grow in his faith. He thought he had to set down the Bible, walk away from it, and spend time praying and seeking God. And he thought that it was when he would seek God, apart from Scripture, that his faith would really grow. But as he matured in in his leadership, he discovered that it was the times when he would spend time reading Scripture, memorizing Scripture, pouring into it, that that actually grew his faith more than just praying alone, that there was something about the Word that helped grow him and encourage him. Even Warren Wearsby, who was a pastor in New York, pastor to Jim Cimbala of Brooklyn Tabernacle, He said that when he was younger and earlier in ministry, he studied scripture just for the purpose of teaching other people. He thought that's what it was good for. But as he matured and as he grew as a leader, he discovered the value in in seeking God through scripture in and of itself, that he actually grew more as he spent time meditating on and memorizing scripture. And that became the wellspring for him to be able to pour out and invest in others. Peter, in our passage, learned the value of appealing to Scripture as an authority greater than himself. All three of these men that we've looked at, they learned the value, not of looking at Scripture just as a source for them to teach from, but as the very source of life for them, the thing that would grow them closer to God and give them the fuel to encourage other people around them. We can find God's love, God's joy, God's peace as we spend time seeking God through Scripture if we spend that time and allowing it to get into us. Peter knew that in his day and tried to convey that as he quoted from the book of Joel. I think each of us, when we spend time seeking God through the word as well, it can impact us in such a great way. So we saw in the passage that Peter learned the value of unity. He he learned the value of appealing to an authority higher than himself. Let's go ahead and turn back to the passage and see what he says as 
he continues speaking after quoting from the book of Joel, starting in verse 22. Fellow Israelites, listen to these words. This Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs that God did among you through him, just as you yourselves know. Though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge, you used lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. God raised him up, ending the pains of death, because it wasn't possible for him to be held by death. You know, so many times we as Christians, we like to complicate the message of Jesus, the gospel message. We, we glamorize it, we, we mesmerize it, we overanalyze it. But in the process of doing so, we forget that simple really is better. In the early 80s, there was a famous movie, you may have heard of it, uh, Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark. In the movie, there, there was probably one of the funniest scenes in the movie that was never scripted to be that way. In the middle of the movie, Indiana Jones was, was trying to rescue his love interest, Miriam, from a bunch of Nazi sympathizers in Cairo, Egypt. These were thugs, really bad guys. And so in one scene, he's fighting five of them, all with his iconic whip. He's able to fight them off, and the next scene comes in where there's a guy that is dressed all in black. He's wielding a big sword, and he's ready for another fight. Well, Harrison Ford's character steps up, he pulls out the gun, and he shoots the guy and ends the scene. Many of us don't know that, that that scene wasn't actually planned that way. Steven Spielberg and Harrison Ford, they, they met together the night before they filmed that scene, and they blocked out three pages of script for this very intense fight scene that was supposed to be between the swordsman and Harrison Ford. We also don't know that Harrison Ford and the rest of the crew that was filming in the deserts of Tunisia had been sick for seven days with dysentery. Not only that, it was over 120 degrees every single day while they were filming in those deserts. They were sick. They were dehydrated from that sickness. They were exhausted. And so on the eighth day of filming, as Harrison Ford came up to this scene and the swordsman came, he ad-libbed. He was exhausted. He pulled out the gun and shot the guy. It, it's hilarious. We love it. We laugh at it. Simple really was better. The reason that scene stuck was because simple was better. Life is complicated enough on its own. It's filled with sickness. It's filled with difficulties. We don't need to add one more thing to complicate the one thing that can give hope to people in whatever season they're in when they're looking desperately for a moment of hope. The gospel message. Simple is better. In the late 1700s, um, there was a young man named William Carey who was commissioned to be the first evangelical missionary to go from London, England, all the way to India to serve there. Now, William Carey was probably the least likely choice that anyone should have chosen to be a missionary. When he went, he wasn't trained to be a pastor. He wasn't trained to be a missionary. He was trained to be a shoemaker. Not only that, but he also had a horrible stuttering problem. Most people couldn't understand just a sentence that he would get out. It took forever for him to say anything. And yet he went in obedience because he felt like God had called him to go to serve as a missionary. When he arrived in India, he studied the two languages that he encountered enough so that he could talk and converse with anyone, both with Hindi and Sanskrit. And he shared the simple message of Jesus dying and risen from the dead to forgive us of sins and make us right standing with God to anyone who would listen to him. It took a few years to gain traction, but in the time that he was in India, thousands of people came to faith in Christ. And after that time, he went back to London. He, he began sharing with anyone, would-be missionaries, or anyone else who would listen to him. The same two points that he shared so many times before from Isaiah 54. Expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. He actually did just that, and his legacy today is that there are more than 27.8 million people who have called Jesus their Lord and Savior in the country of India. Now, there's still a lot of work to be done there, but God did an amazing work as he was willing to simply proclaim the gospel, the truth of who Jesus is. Simple is better. In Peter's day, God brought the nations to his doorstep. Literally, people from all over the world came to hear and see what was going on as they saw this, this profound movement of the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem. 
that particular weekend. As the Holy Spirit moved, Peter learned the value of unity. He learned the value of appealing to an authority greater than himself, to Scripture as a means of proclaiming truth and providing a reason for, for what was going on. He learned the value of simply saying Jesus, and that was enough to transform hearts and minds. I actually want to read one more time that, that those final verses uh, because there's something so profound about what Peter said in simply saying those words. I actually want to read it from the message translation, though, because I think Eugene Peterson's version of this helps to explain it even better. Jesus the Nazarene, a man thoroughly accredited by God to you. This Jesus, following the deliberate and well-thought-out plan of God, he was betrayed by men who took the law into their own hands, and he was handed over to you. You pinned him to a cross and killed him, but God untied the death ropes and raised him up. Death was no match for him. And death is no match for Jesus. Because of what Jesus did in and through the cross, we can be forgiven from sin, from death, from shame, from isolation, from fear, from so many things that hold us back if we're willing to surrender to Jesus. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Today, if you have yet to say yes to Jesus, or maybe you said yes to Jesus, but, but you need to recommit your life to him, I want to encourage you, listen again to the simple gospel message, the good news. It's this. God created the world for good, but sin entered the world and broke our relationship with God and with other people. The Bible says that the wages or the consequences of sin is death. And sin simply means just missing the mark, not being perfect 100% of the time. We're all guilty of that. No one is perfect. The Bible says that God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. The Bible also says that God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to then embody, to take on the weight of the consequence of sin that we deserved so that we might experience God's righteousness and the life that God created us for. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Today, if you need to say yes to Jesus, do it now. Don't let this moment pass. Matter of fact, let's pray. And as we pray, if you need to say yes to Jesus, I want to invite you right now, look up at me. I'm going to guide you in a prayer, and I want to encourage you to say the words that I say them, to invite Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior. Go ahead and pray with me. Jesus, I need you. I admit that I have made mistakes, that because of what I've done, that I deserve something horrible. But I thank you that you died on the cross, not only to forgive me of that sin, but to give me new life. And so I pray today that you would be my leader. May you guide my life. May you be the Lord and Savior of my life. In Jesus' name, amen.